Thanks, Andy. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> so while the lights get turned down, um, how many of you guys are designers? Most of you. Okay, and what about project managers? And you can be one, you can be both. Project managers, great. And how many of you work with your clients on like a daily basis? Okay, so yeah, this is, you're, you're at the right place. Um, so I'm Megan Miller, as Andy said. I work at Stanford University. I'm with the Central Web Agency at Stanford, and we serve, um, ooh, we're having some fun lights here. <laughs> we serve um, all sorts of clients around the university. So Stanford is huge. There are, I think, 15,000 employees at Stanford. Um, the number of employees to student ratio is extremely high. Uh, and there's tons of different offices and departments that need custom uh, design work, uh, custom website solutions. Uh, and so our team is located centrally in Stanford to support all of those people and their offices at Stanford. So we're a small team, but we, um, we run a tight ship. And we also provide resources for the whole rest of campus for self-service web resources. So I'm also designing themes, templates, um, you know, get your own website kind of things for everyone at Stanford, including students, faculty, staff. So there's a lot of things that I'm working with on a daily basis, and uh, today I'm going to share with you some of my strategies for design thinking in the way that I work with my clients. And I'm hoping this can kind of open your minds if it hasn't been opened already by the concepts of design, design thinking to rethink your uh, design and discovery process. Sorry, a little delay there. So what is design thinking? I'm gonna read this quote because I think this is really, really, like this quote just captures it for me. Design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. So this is from Tim Brown, he's the president and CEO of IDEO. This is the firm that really pioneered design thinking in the workplace and design thinking across the board for all of us. So how can we understand this uh, methodology and apply it to our client relations process? Let's innovate. Here's a traditional design process that I bet a lot of you are really familiar with. We start with discovery, we do wireframes. Oh, that sounds a little better. <laughs> uh, we do design comps. There are a lot of artifacts that happen during this process that we use to document the decisions made along the way and to help us communicate with our developers and with the client. Some of these artifacts are user personas, task flows, site maps, wireframes, style tiles, design comps. I should be speaking the language of your subconscious at this point. Um, Essentially, these are communication tools. They help us articulate hierarchy, structure, aesthetics, and user experience. They facilitate decision making by translating our client's desires into tangible representations of the final product. Yet sometimes, despite our best intentions, our tools can become barriers to that effective communication that we're seeking. So here's the real truth. Most clients don't understand a lot of these materials that we find so intuitive. The wireframe, for example, is a notoriously problematic tool. On one hand, it's essential for visualizing layout and structure, but on the other, it can introduce a layer of confusion to the client, especially now when we have responsive web design. Here's how the story usually goes. I hand a client a set of wireframes, explain that they're representations of how we might structure their site. They respond with a furrowed brow and they ask, is it gonna be gray? Is that the font that my site's gonna use? I bet a lot of you have had this experience. We then spend the next 15 minutes explaining what a wireframe is, why it looks that way. And then they often default to what we've presented to them or they seem frustrated and they wanna see another revision. So we're not getting the right kind of feedback from our clients. They get stuck instead of understanding the purpose of the tool that we, we are using a wireframe to allow us to envision possible layout options. But when we hand them a PDF or a piece of paper, they just see a PDF or a piece of paper and they see static content 
stuck into boxes and they don't understand in their head how to move things around. They might not even be spatially oriented. A lot of designers are very spatially oriented. So in your head, you might be able to envision things. There are some people in the world that aren't that way. I mean, it's, we're all different, right? So I think what I've found is a lot of clients are not necessarily spatially oriented and have trouble translating what they're seeing in the wireframe to what could be. What's happening is the wireframe tool is making it hard for our clients to give us the feedback we need. They're reacting to the tool itself, not just the ideas that we're presenting them. Things are getting lost in translation here. Our clients have trouble understanding a lot of the ways we communicate during the design process. Clients don't speak designer, and our artifacts are not self-apparent. We think they are, because we're used to them. We've been trained to get used to that type of artifact, but they don't, and they don't know how, and this might be their very first website project. So wireframes and other communication tools are meant to give substance to our clients' priorities, goals, and aesthetic preferences. Yet they don't inherently enable our clients to provide the editorial direction or to make those critical decisions that we need them to make. So without that clear direction from the client, we can spend weeks and weeks in revisions trying to guess what they want. Here's what we're really after when we're working with a client. We're not after wireframes. We're not after user personas. That's something we create for us and for our team and just as an artifact to solidify the decisions that were made. But what we're after when we engage with a client is understanding their priorities, their goals, their aesthetic preferences, getting them to make editorial decision or give us editorial direction and make those critical decisions. This list looks really different than the list we normally think of when we think of a design process. So how can we rethink our design process to get what we're really after? The problem with our traditional design process is a problem of communication. Um, there is a language and design literacy barrier between us and our clients, and we can bridge that gap. Actually, it's up to us to do that. We are balancing technical and design considerations, uh, and they don't know how to give us the information that we need, and they don't know where we're coming from. We might be having meetings with our team, talking to development and in engineers, like, is this even possible? The client doesn't know those kind of limitations. So there's a better way. We can apply design thinking to the way that we work with our clients. Let's go back to this quote and see how we can rethink our client engagements from a design thinking perspective. We'll start with human-centered. I apologize, you can't see my highlighting. I should have made it more high contrast. Human-centered. Our design and discovery process should be centered around our clients' experiences. It's, it's about them. The process that we impose on them during their interaction with us is up to us for, to focus on their experience of that process. The designer's toolkit. This is our arsenal of knowledge, the artifacts that we know how to create and create well. It's our user experience skill set. Our skills as designers of experiences come into play when we design an experience for our clients. So I'm down here. The needs of people. We have our own needs and goals. Like I said before, balancing technical and design considerations that we have to think about. But the client does as well. And this might seem obvious, but I just want to reiterate so we see how it fits together in this methodology. Um, their goals are not just to have a good product. Their goals are also to have a good experience during the process, build trust with you as the designer, feel ownership over the resulting product, and understand why we're going through all these steps together. Possibilities of technology. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but we have to balance not only good design principles in our work, but also the limitations of the technology on which we're building. We are the bridge between engineers and the client. It's our job to fully understand those possibilities. And lastly, at the bottom here, all, the, all these considerations must be aimed toward the goal of business success. We want the client to succeed, we want their product to succeed, and we want us to succeed. So 
So let's design an experience for our clients. We are experts at designing experiences. That's what we do. But we need to think about this kind of on a more meta level and apply it to our process of working with clients. Our goals go beyond design. Our goals should be to build trust, establish a common language, collaborate with our clients, inspire ownership, and ultimately reduce time and control scope. These are things that we're all, these, this is what we lose sleep over as designers is when scope creep starts to happen. So how can we do this? There's a couple ways. We can create a structure for conversation that targets the information that we need from them. And we can inspire trust, creativity, and collaboration by creating an environment for play. So let's play. Why do we want to play? Like I said, it builds trust. Playtime establishes common language. Play is inherently coll collaborative. And when people get excited and th enthusiastic about playtime, I know this sounds like kindergarten, but it really does affect all of us, um, it inspires an ownership over what's happening, the process and the decisions that they're making. The best part about play is it does reduce time and control scope. Usually playtime is like a game. And games have structured limitations. Think about a game you've played recently, like a board game or even an iPad game or whatever. Uh, these games usually have a board, a time limit, rules set up like this. These structured limitations help you achieve the goal of the game, or lose, if you're playing against other people. The structures that we can introduce are physical, time-bound, and goal-oriented. So let's look a little bit at some game mechanics. I know we're diverging a little bit here from design thinking, but I think they're really related. The first one I want to talk about is called, is called quests. Quests you might think of in a game are, um, you know, I'm a wizard mage and my quest is to go rescue the maiden locked in the tower behind the dragon or whatever. You know, you've played these games. For us, though, a quest can be getting the client on board and excited about the final goal, excited about the why behind the design process, and understanding the rewards if every party is fully committed to the quest at hand. If the client fulfills their side of the bargain and we fulfill our side of the bargain, we're gonna have an awesome product and we need to get them on board with that vision. It's a quest. Progression, this is another game mechanic. It's relatively simple, but seeing a progress bar is an example of progression. For us, we can see progress by clearly articulating the project's roadmap and goals and setting really uh, distinct milestones that, you're, um, that you can celebrate with your client. Appointment dynamics, this is another game mechanics term. This is usually related to setting um, time appointments. So for example, here's the game, show up at this location at this time, you're gonna get a clue, okay? For us, we can translate this a little bit to being time-bound workshops. You've got five minutes, let's brainstorm this one thing. We all do this with our teams and with each other, but we don't do it with our clients often enough. And what I've found is that it really gets them excited. They feel like they're <laughs> learning how to be a designer. And it's, it's really important that they feel that way. It builds trust in you as a teacher, and that relationship, um, the bond that you create there is really special. Not to get too touchy-feely here. So for each goal that we have, we can create a tool. So here's Catan, who, who plays Catan. Oh yeah, we like Catan, okay. Um, <laughs> in Settlers of Catan, you can uh, build a settlement and a city and a road, and I guess you get ships and some versions. I don't have the ship version. Um, so each, each little tool is in your arsenal. You have this little tool, and you can take it out and do what you need to with that tool. We can do this as well. Our tools should provide structure and assist the client in reaching a particular goal. The game mechanics we just described can be applied to specific time-bound workshops and materials that we create for our client. 
I would like to propose that we use more physical tools in our design and discovery process. So let's talk about why. Physical interaction builds fundamental concepts. This is a quote I found recently from the Encyclopedia of Play, which is really an interesting resource. Fundamental corporeal concepts such as near and far, hard and soft, jagged and pointed, weak and strong, open and closed, and so on, are rooted in animate movement. When we're children, when we're babies, and we're learning how to interact with the world, it's the physicality of bumping our bodies into things, sticking things in our mouths, that help us understand really fundamental concepts of life. We already have this ingrained in us. We naturally speak the language of the physical. We as designers, especially in web design where everything's virtual, we don't take advantage of this often enough. Physical artifacts can act as translators for us. We can use them and take advantage of everyone's natural ability to interact physically to translate between us, our goals, the limitations we're balancing, and our client. So how can we harness the power of these physical experiences? We actually do this already. We just don't know it. Sketching and diagrams, brainstorming activities, post-it notes, we already do this. Sketching reveals solutions to complex problems through articulating those complexities visually. Here's a great quote I found. Drawing your idea helps you address its structure with a different part of your brain and see it from a new angle. This is really what happens when you sketch out your eyes. Yeah, yeah, wireframing on the whiteboard. This is my life. Yeah, so we need to be drawing things, and we need to draw things with our clients, and it helps them to draw them as well. Having physical artifacts also gives them something to react to. I'm sure you've noticed when you hand them a design comp or a wireframe, they immediately have a reaction. It's either positive or it's negative or it's unsure. Um, they're reacting to the physical artifact, whether you made it polished and glossy or you know, cheap printout, but they're also reacting to what they see. Reaction is something that the client does know how to do. They just don't know how to give the right feedback yet. But physical tools can help us get the right reactions if we have the right tools. Physical tools also facilitate communication and collaboration. Because we can look and talk and point at an object, pass it around, we can have a better communication pattern. Here's another quote. Externalizing ideas allows for closer collaboration, earlier input, and deeper thought partnership. This ultimately builds trust. Sharing the journey with the client and being transparent is key to establishing trust. By involving the client from the early stages, they become more invested. I know there's some, you know, some people have mixed feelings about whether to do live wireframing with a client. Uh, in my experience, I've never found that to be disastrous. Often there's a step where I have to go back and interpret it and refine it and make it better. <laughs> but getting them involved in that first stage has been really important. Physical tools are also awesome because they give us just enough space for creativity within a predetermined structure that can guarantee success. So here we're at looking at a coloring book. Coloring books are great. They, they train children to think creatively within small limitations. It's really hard if you hand someone a blank piece of paper. You know, I don't know if, you, if any of you are artists, but you see the blank canvas and you're like, oh God, what am I gonna put on this canvas, right? If I saw something with a few more outlines, it'd be a lot easier to start. Of course, we don't want everyone coming out cookie cutter, so it's something to balance, but we can find that balance and make, um, take advantage of these kind of structures to help people come up with the right ideas. By giving them structure that makes them feel comfortable and capable, we can inspire them to take ownership over parts of the process. This helps them make those critical decisions that we really need them to make and it provides invaluable input at every stage and helps us be more agile. The structure of the tool itself can guide clients to solutions that we know will work, both from a design standpoint and a technical standpoint. So this is just like 
what we're looking at, color by numbers, right? This is a very simple example, but we maybe, maybe I know how a dinosaur looks, because I time travel, obviously, and I saw one, and so I know the colors. I'm going to write down a code, and my kid is going to be able to color in the right colors and see what a dinosaur looks like. We got to take the same attitude towards client discovery. We know what we're trying to get from our clients. How can we help them unearth that? So I'd like to introduce um, a new take on our designer toolkit. So if you remember, these were our design artifacts, our design toolkit that we've used in the past with our clients, wireframes, personas, style tiles, design comps. Each of these does have a purpose. User personas help us keep in mind who our users are. Task flows help us outline all the steps in the process, et cetera. And if you remember, here's what we're really after. Priorities, goals, aesthetic preference, editorial direction, decision making. So I'm going to show you some tools that I use to get closer to these goals. Today, I'm going to show you pieces from the Tactile Design Kit. It's available for free online, Creative Commons, so feel free to use it, remix it, whatever. Um, I have found this so useful, I just wanted to make sure everyone had it. So here's what's in the Tactile Design Kit. And some of this you'll see kind of resonates with the artifacts we're trying to create as designers. In the kit, um, we have a set of worksheets that are meant to be run in a physical, time-bound uh, exercise with your client. So it's a workshop experience. And let's look at each of these in the context of a sample discovery and design process. So I have a kickoff meeting with my client. It's your chance to introduce the process roadmap to sh get them on board with that quest, the goal that we're, we're trying to aim for. Here you can introduce the specific activities that we're going to do along the way to reach those goals and get their buy-in and set the right expectations and tone for the project. This is a really critical meeting and it's very much about you presenting this process to the client and getting them excited. Also during kickoff meeting, uh, you'll conduct high level kind of discovery with the client, interviewing them to understand their business goals, the requirements for the project. If you had an RFP, you're probably going to be digging into that at this meeting. Another critical thing to do early on is uh, establish government, governance and roles. Who is responsible for what on what team? This is so important. This is just like a game, right? Whose side are you on? What are you playing? What's your strategy? You know, what's the gameplay here? So it really is important to establish those roles early on. By presenting a visual roadmap showing phases of the project, uh, and also showing the rough timeline, you can actually introduce uh, from the beginning uh, this idea of the quest. What I like to do also is I have this spot here on the left where we actually fill out the dates for each of these. So in the very first meeting, we schedule it. We schedule everything in advance. And it gets them committed and realizing that they got some work to do. By doing this, you can ease the client's worries about time, budget, and site delivery by establishing really clear goals and timeline. This also holds them accountable and gets them to think about the impact on their staff resources. All right, so introducing, now we're getting into using the kit. So the kickoff meeting is really important. It's setting the stage for what you're going to be doing with the client. The very next thing I usually do is define user personas. If there is user research available, or if you are being hired to conduct, conduct that, you'd do that first. You would then summarize that user research to the client in some format that they can digest. But I would actually say, hold off on making the personas and do that with your client. So during this session, we are going to create user personas with the client, and we're going to prioritize them. By having these as physical artifacts, we can actually physically prioritize them on the wall. This is the top piece of the persona template that's part of the design kit. What I actually do beforehand, and I'll show you afterwards, I have the kit here with me and I'll show you. I have 25 pre-made personas that just have a photo and a name, but nothing else. 
um, that are all cards, and we can kind of play around with having pictures of people. Another way to do this, if you want to make it even more fun, is to bring in some like people magazines or something, and you can like cut out people's heads and paste them in. So you can make this as fun as you want, or you can do some prep work on this piece of the kit. But you're prompting them to fill out demographic information, relevant details. They're the subject matter experts, your clients. They're going to know who, this, who their audience is. And if they don't, you've hopefully done some research for them to help them know. But talking it through with the client helps them understand their users. This is so important. We, we often just make the persona and then say, here's your user. But they don't know that person yet. They haven't become familiar with them. They need to become friends with this person. They need to empathize with them. So by filling out this sheet, we can get that to happen a lot more. So on the sheet, I have, um, and again, you can tweak this to be whatever categories you like, but I have loves, dislikes, um, special considerations, and needs to dot, 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 where you fill in the blank. This person needs to do X, Y, Z on your website or with your organization. Here's my 25 persona cards, which I can show you afterwards. We can play with them if you want. I laminate these, and I use wet erase markers. It's like kindergarten. It's really fun. And what ends up happening is we start filling out, passing these people around, getting to know them. We start to refer to them by first names. The client starts to refer to them by a first name. They get excited about knowing these people. And the more they know these people, I mean, they're going to love these people. They're their customers or their audience if they're not doing a you know, sales website. So we can actually set these cards up and reorder them to prioritize them. Having a physical artifact lets us do that easier with our clients. OK, moving on. Another thing we have to do is determine their aesthetic preferences. This is hard. This is really hard. I don't know how many of you struggle with this, but I really did for a while. And what I found is the reason that this is hard is because the client doesn't understand what we mean when we say bright or modern or friendly they don't necessarily understand what that means in terms of design. There is a gap in this design terminology. We have a lot of terms we use to describe how designs feel. And we've developed those as designers over a long period of time. Our client has no idea. They just, I mean, they have their own concept of what those words mean, and it's usually within their context. So we're playing a little game of like finding clues to triangulate and understand what they mean when they say drab you know, boxy, if they want to choose one of those words, we need to figure out what they mean, because it probably doesn't mean what we think it means. So here's what I've created to help with this. <laughs> I went online and I searched for like every list of um, descriptive words I could find on the internet, and I culled these and I collected them and I created very these are very personal collected groups. I thought they were, you know, roughly okay. So we've got um, on the left, bright, clean, crisp, fresh, sleek, light, open, minimal, subtle, subdued, modern. We have another group, uh, intelligent, scholarly, editorial, neutral, objective. So I have all these words here because what I found is when I show a client something, they don't know what to say. They're like, oh yeah, I like it. They don't know how to do critique. They don't know, they're not trained in this. So we're going to help them by giving them this one sheet that's a visual vocabulary reference. And the words are grouped in such a way that they could kind of find like words. So if they didn't like a particular one but wanted something in that grouping, they could find one. And I actually run this in conjunction with a website design review. So what I do is I prepare like five to six example sites of like peer websites to my client. So I just did the Department of English at Stanford, and I showed them Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley, you know, some of the other big top Ivy League schools. We looked at their websites, and I had them have their little vocabulary reference, and we have this worksheet. I know it sounds really silly, but it really helped. They, they definitely got into it. And what we answer is four different questions. What words would you use to describe this site? So they look at their little sheet, pull a word out. What features or functionality do you find compelling? This helps us actually get a little hint at like, ooh, they really like that like pop-up date nav thing. Okay. Um, what do you like about this site? Just a general open-ended question. What do you dislike about the site? And that one usually has the most um, answers. And I actually do a more a robust worksheet. I actually print, it's a bigger worksheet where I print a screenshot of the website 
and I have these boxes for these different questions. But this is a simple one you can do. And by their answers, and I actually collect all the worksheets after so I can compile them into one, um, by what they write down, I can narrow in on what they, what they actually mean when they say, oh, that looks very modern. It probably wasn't what I thought when I thought modern. So I can translate between me and them using these tools. And it helps me kind of like discover more about what they're thinking. After I do a website review with them, oh, I forgot to mention, so I do peer institution websites, but I also do websites that I think they might like, just any website that has like an aesthetic preference I'm guessing they might like, and I choose like a handful of those, five or six. And we can, again, we're triangulating here on the aesthetic preferences of our client. After this, what I like to do is say, so we've looked at all these, we summarized the things they liked the most, and we, usually there's one example site that I found that they really like. And so we look at that again, and we say, all right, let's choose five to 10 words that you want to describe your website. And at this point, it's usually the words that they've already said aloud from the vocabulary list that I now have a point of reference for that we've looked at an example site for. So this is my process for translating um, what clients mean, when clients mean when they say a word that I know means something different in design language. Here's just a snapshot of someone working with the worksheet. All right, now that we've got aesthetic preferences out of the way, we can get into the nitty gritty stuff, navigation and layout. I run these as a, a two hour workshop um, with my clients and I run them together because I've found that clients cannot think about navigation without layout and vice versa, just the way it is. Um, so I, I do these together. What we're gonna do is define primary and footer navigation for their website because if you've got that, you've got the basic structure. Everything else underneath in the sub nav can kind of be defined later. And we're gonna craft three core ideas for wireframes, homepage, subpage, um, homepage, landing page, subpage, are usually the depths I work at. So I use a primary navigation worksheet to work with my clients. It has seven boxes that are relatively small because I want them to prioritize. I want them to come up with short words that fit in those boxes and no more than seven. And you know what's really funny? They don't even question this. They're like, oh, I guess I need to get rid of one because it doesn't fit. It's amazing to me. It blows me away. <laughs> you would think this doesn't work, but it really does work. Color by numbers, seriously. So I also have a little bit of extra info here that we can circle and say, oh, this is a landing page that goes to a bunch of other pages. So that's a concept I introduce at that point. The footer navigation worksheet, worksheet is similar. Very small, because usually the text in your footer is really small text. <laughs> small and only six spots, because I try to limit them. And only um, seven, is this, yeah, seven items under every you know, heading. So again, I'm trying to get them to think about priorities cutting things down, choosing what's really important for them. I even, so I laminate these ones as well. So they have to use a wet erase, which is a fat marker. So, you know, it has to like fit in the box. <laughs> I know this is really silly, but you know, it works. The wireframe toolkit is my favorite part of the kit. Um, and please come up and play with it afterwards, because I, I brought it. What I have are, a set of browsers and a set of blocks. And the browser is structured with a 12 column grid that matches the theme that I use on my team to develop with Drupal. So we, we're a Drupal shop. The grid is 12 column grid. The sizes of the blocks fit on the grid, no matter what orientation they put them. And I know whatever they design with those blocks, I can build because it fits on my grid and it works in that structure. Of course, you're gonna have variations, you're gonna have things, some clients that have really strong preferences here. This might not work for everyone, but it works for me, at least in what I found. So here's my kit. It's all Stanford branded, we, because Stanford requires you to have the red header and footer as like a brand. So I just put it there, because they have to get used to seeing it from day one. Again, it's a structured limitation that I'm building in that helps kind of articulate the assumptions that I have as a designer. 
I'm assuming they need to be okay with the fact we're gonna put the red bar on the top and bottom. It's just part of the agreement. So I just show it to them right there. So the kit uses Velcro and laminated cards. And what's cool about this is you can reposition things. So what I do with my clients is, usually I'm the one drawing, because they don't necessarily feel as confident, though sometimes some of them do, depends on the person. Usually I'm sitting at a big table, and I'm sitting, and they're kind of standing around, and we're drawing together, and we're talking about what goes into each spot. Then we talk about priorities, we move stuff up and down. We can even talk about mobile. Because this is Velcro, we can start stacking blocks. Take them off, stack them again. Say, oh, this is how it'll look on mobile. So we've got a responsive theme. I know exactly how it behaves in you know, the, the way it breaks down at each breakpoint. So I can walk them through so they understand how the priority here on the grid maps to mobile. Within each block, we've got creativity. This is that you know, just enough space, just enough space to be creative. And it's the right size that with the wet erase marker, you can't get too detailed, which you don't want in a wireframe. You don't want too much detail. So another piece of all this, whenever you introduce structured limitations, you have to have a way to manage extra ideas that come up. People always think outside the box. It always happens. And you should have an attitude of yes and. And what, we, what I do to do this is I create a stack of what I call idea cards. And I introduce this as part of the gameplay in the beginning. I say, OK, here's our wireframing navigation workshop. Over here are the idea cards. If you come up with a great idea for your product, write it down and stick it in this pile. And later, we can manage this. So this is taking a cue from kind of agile methodologies where we're making a backlog with them. They understand that it's great to have ideas at any time of day and that they should write them down, but that the goal of the workshop is over here. The goal of the workshop is the wireframing exercise. So we can table the idea by writing it down in a, in a structure that's made to support it. So here's an idea card. Um, add a dynamic events feed to the sidebar. And you can sketch it, and you can later you can write down kind of, is this in scope? Um, how hard is it to make this thing? So you can do some analysis with your team after the fact of these cards. If you run these workshops well, you can get most of the information you need to create those traditional design artifacts, which we still create. I still create all of these artifacts, site maps, et cetera. Um, but because I can run these workshops interactively with my client, I find that I can get to a, like a desired result that the client likes much, much faster. We just went through three workshops. You can do that in three meetings. If your site isn't huge, and I know some of you probably work with really big clients, I usually work with like an academic department. It's not the hugest website in the world. Um, you can actually define all these things in like three or four meetings. And because they've been interacting with these phys physical objects and do it, helping you in the process, they have a lot more ownership in the result. Some other workshops you might need to run. So I. What I do is I think about this from like a Lego perspective. It's very modular. So each workshop is, and each worksheet itself is modular. If I decide a certain client needs more, I can add more in. And if I decide that they don't even need something, I can take that out. So some of the, just a couple of the others that I do regularly, I do card sorting a lot. So I'll do that way in the beginning. We'll do like user personas first, then we'll do card sorting. And this, usually what I do is I, I create the cards ahead of time based on their current sitemap. And we have them sort by user. So once we have their per personas identified, we can lay those out and start saying, all right, let's do a card sort based on those users that we did last time. Um, then you can do a card sort for other categories or whatever groupings you might need. So I use these tools in conjunction with other methodologies and tools. Also, the interviews, focus groups, you might need those as well. OK, so let's talk about rules for making good, good tools. I really, as much as I want you to download the Tactile Design Kit and play with it, I really want you to make your own tools that work for you. So let's talk about how to do that. If you craft the right structure, you can get the right input. Create tools that match your technology and your best practices. So let's look in at an example. So here's the theme that we use. Um, it's our, one of our base themes that we use for all the projects we do at Stanford. We're lucky because we have a really contained 
community and we use the same resources over and over. I know that's not the same for everyone, but you, your agency could develop central tools and themes that you use regularly with your clients. If you know the limitations of the, that theme or that technology, you can start to build that into your discovery and design process. So in our theme, we have only one option for a main menu, and that's horizontal. So I know that I don't want more than seven items in that main menu. For it to look good on mobile, be navigable on mobile and desktop, I know I don't want more than seven. That's why this worksheet has seven boxes. So if you have another variation that you like to use with your clients or that you find comes up a lot, think about whether the worksheet can be adjusted to fit that technology as well. Again, our theme supports a six column footer. So I have six boxes. And it seems really obvious, but just think about it. <laughs> your technology can drive the structure of your tools. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the wireframe uh, toolkit now as a kind of story of how this whole thing started, actually. I started working with Stanford Web Services and we didn't have any central resources set up. We didn't have common design patterns that we saw over and over again. Even though we knew they were there, we just didn't have them documented. So I did a whole bunch of research on a bunch of different websites across Stanford. And I looked for patterns. Here's an example website, Department of Physics. What I did was I found elements, common elements, in so many different websites that I was able to generically create miniature um, wireframe components. I called these common blocks, because in Drupal we call them blocks. Nerd time, if you guys want to talk Drupal after, I'll talk Drupal till late in the evening. And from this research, I created a layout library. This is just part of my layout library. I have like many, many balsamic screens of this, where these are variations of different kinds of blocks and the variations that I saw that were common. What's really cool, so since we're a Drupal shop, we work with Drupal features, which are little prepackaged modules and plugin components that you can make. We made these. We saw them so much that we just made them into a feature. Now, when I work with my client, I don't tell them that I have pre-made all these things. I just show them those things, and they say, oh, that looks great, we want that. Because I know they want that, I've done my research. <laughs> so they literally just pick up one of these cards and say, oh, that'll work. And we usually re rename the top of each card with the wet erase marker, but they like it. They like the way it's structured because they've seen it a lot. They don't know that I've done my research and they don't know that my team has already built their site for them. So I'm showing them like tools that I already have in my arsenal. Okay. Good tools also facilitate discussion through thoughtfully, um, being thoughtfully crafted. We need to have a yes and attitude. This is really critical. It's something we learn about through improv. Yes and never say no to a client. We want to encourage them to be creative, but we want to guide them towards the right thing. So on the two navigation worksheets I showed you, I have boxes at the bottom for other important links. Links without a home is what I call them. And clients totally get this. They, they understand that they have to choose seven but if they think of another one, they can just write it down at the bottom. That's okay. And it just releases all the tension of having to make every single critical decision all at once. If you have an ice box, a backlog for the things that are your client's priorities, they start to understand how to do that prioritization, which they're gonna need to do throughout the whole project. We're training them to be good at giving us that information that we need and making the decisions and priorities, um, prioritization that we need them to. I already showed you the idea card. This is, again, my solution to out-of-scope ideas. Another thing to consider is sometimes one tool isn't good enough. So I have complementary tools. I already mentioned this, but I run the navigation worksheets with the wireframe toolkit. I've just found that it works better that way. Um, sometimes you don't get everything finished right away, but it gets you way farther along than you taking a guessing game running by the client, doing a revision, doing a guessing game, back and forth. The other thing to think about is give an example. So here, 
I know that they want a home button on their main menu. If they want to argue with me, sure, let's argue. But I think they should have a home button on their main menu. It takes up one of their critical spots. It takes up one of their seven critical spots. So I'm giving them an example of what kind of word to write in the box and one that I think that they do want. And this helps them kind of get going and gets their ideas flowing. Labeling matters. So I was really careful about labeling for uh, these worksheets. In the site descriptor one, choose five to 10 words that describe your new website. The reason why labeling matters is if you run a workshop with four or five, even six people, they each have their own copy of these things and they're gonna miss your instructions. So we need to have at least a little clue on the piece of paper. And this helps people who are more introverted and you know, less about saying things openly, write down their ideas and kind of have their own moment. Because I found that some people do have trouble speaking up in a group, especially in their, on their team. If they're not the higher up on the team, they might not feel like their voice matters. But if five of them write down an idea that no one said, and I get those afterwards, and I go, oh, maybe that's something we should talk about. I can facilitate talking about that. So labeling does matter because it helps people kind of zoom in on their little worksheet if they want to. But don't over-label. This is really important. So let's look at the visual vocabulary reference. What I'm doing here is I'm testing my assumptions. In the bottom right of the visual vocabulary are three columns of words that are negative. KG, cluttered, contained, rigid, complex, scattered, frenetic, conservative. So I don't know if the client thinks those are bad words. I think they're bad because I'm a designer. I would never want someone to call my design KG. That would be horrible. Or drab but they might like that word and might want their website to feel that way. So I don't label those words as negative words. I just grouped them together. And what I've seen happen is the client will start reading through the list and they'll be like, oh, that's a bad word. I'm like, yes, yeah, some of them can be, some of them can be negative. Because I want them to tell me if they think that they're negative or not. Another rule for good tools, set expectations and mindset. From the beginning, we have to set a tone of compassion and fun. This is critical to uh, inspiring the beginner's mind in yourself and in the client. This is a new process for them. We need to prepare the environment. So this is, this is a workshop I ran. I apologize, it's a little dark. I lay out everything. I have a little spot like marked off with artist tape for the idea cards so when they're done, they can like put them in this little spot. When they walk in, they're like, oh, what are we gonna do today? And then they look on the board and I have a little checklist of our agenda for the day. It's fun, it gets them really excited. And it helps them have trust in us that we know what we're doing. We have a goal, we have an agenda, and we have these fun tools that we're gonna do to get there. The other thing is when you're introducing that exercise, you need to set the rules for collaboration. So this might be um, inspiring people who don't speak up to you know, take turns and say what they're thinking. Whatever it is, you're gonna have to feel out the dynamics of the group, but you wanna make sure you um, open it up and say all ideas are good ideas. We have the idea cards. If you think it's a bad idea, whatever, just write it down on the idea card and um, get people to understand that they can be open and brainstorm with you. We also need to be agile. Iterate, test, get feedback. Iterate, test, get feedback. This is critical, and every time you run this process, you might want to refine your toolkit. I do this all the time. I don't relaminate every time, because that's a pain in the butt. So, let's imagine. Crafting tools with built-in limitations that support specific design and discovery goals can help us streamline the process. Anything's possible with enough time and money, but most clients don't have that much money, so we wanna do our best to help reduce the time and the money spent on their project. We have to balance technical and design considerations when working with our clients. If our tools can better support the limitations and best practices we're working with, we can speed up the conversation. You should design tools that encourage clients to use pre-built solutions that you know exist and work well. This is really important for accessibility reasons. So let's say you have a carousel or a slideshow that you know really works well and is accessible. You wanna encourage them to use that one, not the other one. 
And you can just present them that one option if that's the one you know works. And if they really complain, then sure, present the other options. But you know, you, you could start with the thing that you think is the best thing that's going to get them where they want to go. Create a repeatable process. Don't reinvent the wheel. Think modularly and create reusable tools that can be reconfigured into different workshops with different clients. We need to be forging meaningful relationships between you and the client and between the client and their product. If they don't have any ownership in that product, they're not going to maintain it over time. I've seen this a lot where we hand off a website and it just dies because they haven't been involved in the process. They haven't been committed to it. They haven't understood their users. I love this quote, Josh Brewer, design is about relationships. It is. It's about our relationship to other people. It's about our relationship of our product to people, what it means to them in their life. And it's our relationship with our client. Our clients are hugely important to our success as designers in the world. And empathy is the key to that success. So I have a couple links and resources if you guys want to learn more about any of these things. These are just three things that I found really inspiring. Um, game Storming, it's a book you can get with a whole bunch of really fun games. Some of them are more corporate kind of focus, which I don't know, could be fun. But there's some really cool things in there, really, really cool things. Um, Introduction to Design Studio Methodology. This is an article I read in UX Magazine, which I had that moment of like, gosh, I'm doing that. I didn't even know that's what it was called, but that's what I'm doing. But so anyway, Design Studio Methodology, um, very much about live interactive workshops with clients. And if you have not read it yet, A Book Apart has a fantastic book, Design is a Job, by Mike Montero. This book blew me away. And if you want to develop compassion for your clients and for your team and just become a better designer, read that book. It's short. So you can get the Tactile Design Kit online, tactiledesignkit.com. And I'm going to put the slides up probably later tonight or tomorrow on my website so you can download them. And if you want to connect on Twitter, Megan Aaron Miller. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, so the question is, um, how does content strategy fit into this process? Uh, I have like a dirty secret maybe as a designer. I actually think I'm more of a content strategist than a designer. I mean, I do design as my day job, but every single second I'm like, wait, I'm doing content strategy all the time. Every meeting is about content strategy. Getting them on board with the user personas is all about content strategy. It's understanding those users so that they can make decisions later on in the game that help them get that, that content tweaked to be correct. So yeah, so that's why I run the user persona workshop first, because then I go into navigation, whatever, layout, and we always have the users there. They're there in the room. And we go, hey, you know, does this um, bit of text or does this tone fit? Is this wording fit with that user? Are we you know, resonating there? So for me, it's, it's very much about a user-centered approach. And that's my angle for getting them to think about content strategy. Most of them aren't going to become content strategists. And they often, in my experience, especially at Stanford, they're small teams, and none of them are communication specialist people. So I am helping them a lot. And like in the Department of English website redesign we did, it's very content heavy. And we devised this whole back end kind of category tagging for their news based on their annual newsletter they create every year. So I did, again, I picked apart 10 years of their newsletter, came up with those categories. I showed them. I was like, there's your category. Do you see it? And they were like, oh, we see it. So I'm helping them understand content strategy through all those different steps. Yeah, so the question is, what's the difference between marketing and user experience design? Um, I guess my short answer is good marketing should be user experience design. We should be honestly marketing our products, and we should be I mean, I think they should be the same. I think when you feel like marketing is being false, that's because there's a mismatch between the marketing strategy and what the users actually want. So that's my answer. So the question is, um, whether, what's the relationship between using static prototypes and dynamic prototypes in working with your clients? Um, I think dynamic prototypes are super critical, especially now with responsive web design. So I usually get to that stage. Um, but 
what I back to what I focused on in the kind of second part of the talk. The physicality of having this printed thing is really special. There's something like really powerful that happens when you hand someone this fun toolkit, and it helps them get really engaged. And it's that ownership. We're trying to inspire them to own that artifact. If they can't touch it, if it's in the screen, they're playing with something you made. They don't own it. Even if you built it, built it with them in the same room, because you know how to code, I mean, that's scary to them. Coding and Drupal and whatever, this is all scary to the client. We need to make it less scary. So I think there's a place for dynamic prototyping, and I do do that. Um, but I do it a little later in the game, um, usually after we've gone through a lot of these workshops I just described. So you can have an idea for some of your wireframes. Then you can make a, a, pro a dynamic prototype and show them the mobile responsive behavior. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question is, let me see if I got that right. Uh, what's the advantage of a gamified approach to your process with your client versus an approach that exposes them to the effect it has on their users right away? Yeah. So if you want to introduce that, um, you can introduce like rapid prototyping and test user testing in the process. Um, so you need something to do any sort of testing. So again, this is really early discovery type of workshops. So you got to get something out the door um, to even test it with a real user. But yeah, so just like you were bringing up, we could very easily, right after that first wireframing workshop, make a dynamic prototype, run a user test with one of their users in the room, and have them witness what happens. So yeah, I think you can integrate integrate that type of iterative um, user testing into the process. Yeah. Yeah, OK, so the question is, when your clients have bad taste, <laughs> what do you do? Right? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Um, what I like to do is show more and more examples and talk about successful stories um, that meet users' needs. So I might take something completely out of their industry or whatever, but show them something that I think is in the aesthetic direction that might be appropriate. So I'm leading them, and we can discuss why it works. If they start seeing like five or 10 examples of these, they'll start to see that their own preferences might not match up. So it's like a comparison game. And at that point, yeah, you might run into a stubborn personality, and it's going to happen. Ultimately, they're paying your bills. So I think read Mike Montero's <laughs> book. He talks a lot about that, about client, clients redoing your design comp. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting, challenging thing. Yeah. Um, I've never worked with any teams that are virtual uh, in this way. I think, I think what you could do, since this is a printable kit, I mean, you can send PDFs and you can run the workshop from afar and have them literally just take phone pictures and scan them back to you. I mean, that's what we're doing anyway in the room. It's like I'm walking around taking snapshots with my phone. Um, it would definitely take a lot more leading them through the exercise, especially the wireframing if you have to, you know, it's harder to sketch from afar. <laughs> but um, I think you'd have to think creatively about how to run a workshop using some of these principles from afar and maybe have them set up their own little kind of area to do these exercises on their end while you're with them through video chat or something. So I think the best part there is you need to build an ally on their team that's going to take ownership of this. Again, design is a job. Great book. He talks all about building allies with your clients. So yeah, that would be my answer to that. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm going to set up the kit. So if you want to come take a look at the kit, I'll have it over here.